Right, well, um, welcome everyone and thank you for coming to the Renmark uh, Greek Orthodox Church Hall for the meeting this evening. My name is Penny Kasler, I'm from the South Australian uh, State Emergency Service. Um, the purpose of the meeting is to provide you with some information this evening about the River Murray flood event that clearly you are all aware of. Um, I just would like to start with an acknowledgement of country. The NCS acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise a continuing connection to land, waters and communities. We acknowledge the first people of the River Murray area as custodians of the region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to those living people today. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to Elders past and present. So the format of the evening is going to be run the same as the format as at the last session we ran. Can I just have a little bit of a show of hands who came to the meeting that we ran here about three weeks ago? Awesome. Great. All right. Um, so we've got a um, range of speakers here tonight for you again. Um, we've got um, obviously our incident controller from SES who will be able to give you some information about the updated um, flooding situation. We've got Department of Environment and Water, so that's um, sometimes we refer to them as due. We've got the Renmark Pouring Council. We've got Department of Infrastructure and Transport, that's DIT. Um, and they're the people who look after the ferries, the loads and the freight. We've got Primary Industries and Regions SA, so sometimes called PERSA. We've got Housing SA who provide relief here in South Australia, so they'll be um, probably a topic that you definitely want to hear about tonight. We've got SA Power Network, sometimes we call them SAPN. They're here tonight as well, and SA Water. We've also got um, South Australian uh, Ambulance Service, or SAS, um, SAPOL and also South Australian Tourism Commission representatives here. So what we're going to do is get our guest speakers to um, go through the uh, information for you first. That'll take uh, about um, an hour and then we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, like we did last time, we've got sticky post-it notes, these lovely yellow post-it notes, um, just on the table as you come in by the map over there. Um, so if you have a question that you don't get a chance to ask once we open up the floor, or if you've got a question that you don't wish to ask publicly and you just want to write it down um, instead, we've got big white sticky sheets up the back here with each of the agencies' name on it. So if you've got a question for SA Power Networks, you can write that on your little sticky note and, and pop it up there. Um, we're not promising that we're going to get back to all of the questions, unfortunately, but what we are doing with all of that information we're gathering from you is actually using it to feed into our frequently asked questions and our weekly newsletters and things like that. So we really want to know what it is that you want to know about because that is helping us to provide you with the right information. Um, we are live streaming tonight as well, like we did last time. Um, we are not sure how many people we're going to get online, so hello to everyone who is online. Um, I think last time we had about 300 people online. So we may not get to answer all of the online questions. But again, if you um, pop your questions in there, we are having people looking at those questions um, in the next uh, few days and trying to gather some themes and make sure that we do provide answers um, to those questions as well if we can. Um, the brochures, again, we've bought a lot of brochures tonight and all of the agencies sitting here have also got brochures with them as well. The brochures are up on the table by the door with a big SES sign above the table. So please help yourself to any of those brochures. If you've got friends and family who didn't come tonight or didn't, um, weren't able to get here, please feel free to take um, copies of those brochures for those other people as well. Um, anything that's laminated, if you could please leave it behind because they're my things that I'm using for the meeting, so if you can leave the laminated sheets there. Uh, and the other thing that we have brought tonight on the table over by the map, I've got some um, uh, fact sheets that have been translated into Punjabi, Greek and Filipino. So if you do know some people from those communities um, throughout the area and want to take some brochures for those people in their languages, um, please take those as well. 
Um, in terms of mapping, we've just got the one example map tonight. Um, all of the information is online and all of the information is also available at your local council office. So if you go to um, a, a website online, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, the SAGelf.au website, um, you can go to all of the mapping information there. But if you don't have access to the internet and you need help to do that, um, then please go to your local council and we'll be able to give you help. Um, one of the things that was said at the last meeting was we want a one-stop shop. We want to be able to get all of our information in one place and not have to zoom around to 10 different websites. Um, we took that on board and I think within about a week of that last meeting we actually set up the sa.gov.au website which has got a link to literally all of these people people's um, agencies behind me, so again that is um, some feedback that we were able to work on based on the last um, information session we ran. Right, enough from me, I am going to um, ask our first speaker to talk. Um, Brad Flew is from the SES and he's the incident controller, so he'll kick off the evening for us. Thanks Brad. <laughs> Excellent, I'll just check if everyone can hear me. Excellent, thank you Penny. Um, as Penny introduced, I'm Brad Flew, uh, the current incident controller um, from the State Emergency Service. So firstly, I just want to say a massive thank you for everyone coming out tonight. It's great to see so many faces, um, and this is a great opportunity for us to give you some information and for you guys to ask any questions of us and the other uh, government agencies that are here uh, tonight. Um, so I'd just like to give you a quick brief update, um, or a quick brief rundown of what's going on at the moment and some of the actions that are being undertaken. So we currently have an incident management team that's working from Loxton. Uh, we're based in Loxton. Uh, there's a number of people working uh, with local government, uh, councils, uh, and the other government departments all working on the, on the response to this flood. Since our last meeting, um, we know that the flow forecast has changed um, and we're looking at um, a problem with Council 175 in that first peak. Then we're looking at, and that's in early December. In a, in a second peak, likely in the year, towards the end of December at 185, but I'll allow DW to talk in a minute about the, the forecast in a little bit more detail. But what we do know is these flows are going to be around and greater, or flows that we haven't seen since 1970. Um, so these are, and then our flows greater than we've seen in the last few years. We talked about this last time as well, but um, you know, these are greater than 2016, we're already seeing the levels higher, and you guys know that best being up in Redmark, you can see the levels of the river at the moment. We're already seeing some impacts um, in the local area in Redmark, um, Redmark and Peringa. We know that there's a number of roads that have been closed, um, Lock 5 Road, um, and a number of the levees uh, that are uh, in place are now engaged, meaning there's water up against them. Um, and are currently working to protect property. Um, recently, the Lyric Ferry closed, um, and obviously, Bookman on the Road, which us down towards uh, from Berry to Oxton. Um, to, to assist with the community um, and those preparation activities, um, we know that sandbags has been a bit of a, uh, a bit of a topic of talk. Um, understanding how many sandbags people can access, and that sandbags are available for you to prepare your properties. So we have um, a number of sandbag locations across the River Lake and River District. Uh, ranging from in Peringa here at the uh, corner of Four Lane Street and then Glossop, Glasgow, Manham and other areas down further in, in the river system. In our local area um, here we have the, uh, the levy system, um, the township levy system and the levies outside of town. Um, the council um, and other agencies have done some fantastic work to put those in place um, and have them ready for this event. So um, that's been some absolutely great work. <laughs> Um, for that. However, not everybody that may be here tonight is within some of those levy systems. Um, there's a number of different uh, risks that people may have. So some people are protected by levy systems, some people may be outside of town uh, in areas uh, on floodplains or lower lying areas. Um, and they present two different, two different risk profiles and two different things that we need to think about. So for people outside of the uh, rear market levy system um, and those are lower, lower lying areas, it's really about understanding what your uh, flood risk is understanding what the impacts might be and what you can do to prepare yourself and your property. The, the best way to be able to do that is to go to our sa.gov.au website, use that uh, site as that single source of truth. That's why we set it up, that's um, where all the information from the different agencies uh, is going to be presented for you to be able to access. 
that website has some links to some flood mappings where you can go into there um, and have a look at where your property is located and have a look at what your um, flood risk looks like um, given different flows. There is an example of sort of a product that is available on that website that you can access electronically um, and zoom in down onto your property. But it's important to know that sandbags are a great protection. They are something you can use to protect your property. Uh, but we don't need to uh, set up a huge amount of sandbags to protect your property. The best way to do that is to remove all your lower items as high as possible or relocate them if you have that, that option to sort of get them out of the, the flood impacted areas. Otherwise, lift them up as high as possible and sandbag your doors, vents and drains. Um, doing that will give you the best protection to your property um, and the most effective use of sandbags. So, um, those, like I said, those sandbag locations out here, one here is in Karinga, um, on the corner of Paul Ames Street. Some of the other key messaging is in regards to uh, water safety and safety out, um, out in the area. So some of the risks that were presented to us um, out in the, out in the uh, community, obviously flood water brings its own risks. Uh, flood water can be contaminated, it can have um, submerged objects and debris moving around in it. So we want people to be really careful working around flood water. Uh, we want people to be aware of when they're operating on the water, whether they're using boats and things like that to access uh, different parts of the river or recreational use as well. Um, there's obviously speed restrictions in place um, that we'd ask people to adhere to, which um, DIT I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit more detail tomorrow. Um, navigating on the river, there's obviously um, a number of hazards that are submerged. A lot of these are marked by buoys, you see the yellow buoys out on the river. Uh, they're a great indication of the hazard, however there may be other objects that are not marked or that are floating under the water uh, that you may need to operate in. So we ask people who are going to operate on, on the water, operate within your skill set. If you're not comfortable or, com or confident to do that, uh, then please don't use the, uh, you know, your boats that move on the river. One of the other key messages is around road safety and road closures that are out there. A number of roads have been closed uh, for a number of reasons, uh, whether it's to protect infrastructure, protect damage to the road, or inundation over the road. So those road closures aren't put there just, just because. Uh, there's a number of reasons they may be in there. And I, I really do appreciate that road closures can be quite frustrating and change your access uh, to your everyday life. However, those closures need to be in place. So we really ask people to obey those, um, just to minimise the damage that we're seeing uh, and to minimise the risk to you and your family as well. Uh, driving through flood water presents a whole range of risks. It really doesn't take much water over the road, less than a couple of hundred mil for your car or yourself to be in trouble. Um, cars can flow through surprisingly very easily um, and we really don't want to see anyone um, coming up stuck in those sorts of environments. The other thing with flood water um, is we're starting to see a lot of people playing in flood water um, and that, that's really dangerous. Um, that, that's a big risk to you, your family, your children, um, and anyone playing in those waters. So I can't stress enough how important it is not to play in flood water um, and to encourage your friends and family not to do that. Um, obviously, we, we live and work around in a, in a river area, um, but we want to minimise playing in flood water. So that, that activity is, is quite dangerous, um, and I really can't stress enough um, how much um, man can cause. It can only it can be a couple of inches of water uh, with a bit of flow, so enough to knock people off their feet. Um, and then they're moving in the flow of the water. So please, please don't play in flood water. In regards to think for you guys, the things to consider, uh, when we're engaging um, and looking at our flood risk and understanding what it is, we need you to make, an, a, make a determination of what it is that you're going to do. We strongly encourage people um, to leave, but you need to take in a number of your personal circumstances. So medical, social, financial, um, your ability to be able to stay in your place isolated for a number of months potentially, or, and many, many weeks. The likelihood that you're going to lose power, um, if your property is likely to be inundated, there's a good possibility you'll lose power. Um, access to drinking water, communications, and sewage services. So we ask you to consider all of those things when you're making that decision to stay or go. Um, if you do decide to stay, we ask you to advise your family and friends. Um, and complete a register of um, staying uh, that you are planning to stay. And you can either contact um, Relief, which is available on theystay.gov.au, um, but please advise your family and friends that you're intending to stay. If you're planning to leave, we ask you to leave early. Don't leave it to the last minute or make it as a last minute decision wherever possible. If you want to leave, we need to make sure you have road access and things like that. So if you're planning to leave, 
make that decision early. Uh, last minute decisions can be a difficult decision to make and put yourself under a lot of pressure and work through trouble with. So please make these decisions a little bit early. Um, in the event we understand that some people may be displaced, um, you may not, if your property is likely to be impacted, you may not have anywhere to go. Um, in the first instance, we ask you to consider family and friends, find somewhere um, that they may be able to look after you and put you up. But if you do find yourself um, in a position where you have nowhere to go, we have emergency relief who will be talking tonight, um, and there's a number of options available, and those relief centres will be open with a relief centre open and bearing at the moment. In terms of personal safety, um, we just ask everybody to keep up to date with warnings. Um, make sure you're aware of the current warnings um, and the current uh, situation that's occurring out in the community at the moment. Monitor road closures, um, there's plenty of good information going out through. You can access all of that stuff um, through the Department of Infrastructure and Transport website, which you can access via sa.gov.au. Um, again, I'm just going to stress, please do not drive through flood water. Um, as tempting as it may be to save a few minutes, it will cost you more than a lot. Um, if you're going to undertake any activities on the, on the river, make sure you're undertaking them within your capabilities. And be aware of any um, lower hanging power lines. Um, we're seeing obviously with the river coming up, um, power lines are, are closer to the surface, um, which is bringing people closer to those hazards. So uh, please be aware of those. Um, please don't allow children to play in near flood waters or anything like that as well. And just finally, um, SES, we're currently working um, and doing, what, doing everything we possibly can to communicate with the communities at all times. Um, our public, we've got a number of public information and um, brochures and information that we're getting out to the community um, almost every day. Uh, we're obviously sharing information from our agencies that, who are here tonight as well, um, and we're trying to get as much out. We've got a Senate community newsletter that's coming out uh, once a week. Uh, I believe in our last meeting there was a suggestion about a regular interview on ABC. So SES has a regular spot now on um, the local ABC radio at 7.20 on a Monday morning, uh, where we're using it as an opportunity to run through an update as well. So uh, another avenue to, to get information. Um, as we said, we're identifying the risks and working with all the different agencies and communities to understand what those impacts are looking like and communicate any information we possibly can. And as always, um, for flood and storm response, SES is is um, 132500 as our storm and flood response, but um, in the event of an emergency, triple zero uh, is always the phone number to call. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brad. Um, and I should just say, you're going to hear lots of phone numbers tonight, but um, don't stress about having to write them all down. They're actually on um, the brochures that are here, so um, basically don't, uh, don't panic if you don't catch a number when it is um, called out. Oh, right, um, so the next speaker we're going to call up is Matt Henderson from Department of Environment and Water. Um, as I said before, sometimes you hear us referring to them as Jew. So they are responsible for the flood mapping in South Australia. So I'll call up Matt. Thank you. Thanks for that. Did everybody hear me all right? Yep. Lots of nodding. Um, so that's good. So yeah, um, my name is Matt Henderson. Uh, I work with the water delivery team in the Department for Environment and Water. So I'm based out of Murray Bridge. Um, and basically my role here tonight is to provide an update um, on the forecast flow and the forecast water levels that we're expecting. Um, so I'll start out by saying that the River Murray flow to the South Australian border today was 151 gigalitres a day. So generally when we're speaking about flow to South Australia, we're talking about flow of the border. Um, so there are currently two forecast peaks in the flow that we're expecting to South Australia. So the first peak is estimated to reach between 170 to 180 gigalitres a day at the, at the border, and that's expected to arrive around about the 10th of December. So that's what we're expecting for that first peak. So the second peak is estimated to reach at least 185 gigalitres a day at the South Australian border, and there's a moderate possibility there that it could reach 200 gigalitres a day, or a, a, also a low possibility that it could go to 220. So that second peak is expected to reach the border sometime between the 24th and the 31st of December. So the reason that 
there's a bit of a range there. I'll just explain how the forecasting works a little bit. Is that basically it's only once that water coming down physically arrives in the Murray Channel from the Murrumbidgee, the Darling, the Goulburn and the Edinburgh rivers. That's that's really the point at which we can get start to get an accurate forecast of what's going to come down the actual Murray Channel. Um, so that's that's where we can forecast what's going to come into South Australia. So this is why that first peak has been narrowed down to a less of a range and more of a date um, and that second peak is still a, a range of about a week um, of when it might arrive in South Australia. So regardless of how high those flows get though, what we are certain of is that those higher flows will, can, will persist for some time yet. So it's considered likely that we'll see flows above about 100 gigalitres a day at least into February um, of 2023. So other than these meetings, the best way to stay up to date with the flow forecast um, is by viewing the, the SES warnings and also subscribing to the SA River Murray flow report. So that's put out by my department. Um, that flow report is put out or can be emailed out or accessed online every Friday morning. So it's updated once a week. Um, so you can go to the sa.gov.au website and you can follow the links there to subscribe or you can come and see me afterwards, give me your details and I'll get your, your name and, and details and address put on, put on the mailing list to receive that once a week. So included in that flow report um, are estimated water levels for the various flows at different locations along the river. So um, it basically provides estimated water levels at different towns or other locations along the river um, to say, for example, if the flow did reach 180 gigs a day or 200 gigs a day, you'll be able to look at what the expected levels would be at different points along the river there. Um, so to put that into context for Renmark, given that we're in Renmark, um, at 180 gigs a day, the estimated water level at Renmark is expected to be somewhere around 18.5 metres AHD, and at 200 gigs a day, it would be somewhere around 18.9 uh, AHD. Couldn't get a Renmark uh, level for today, but I did get a lot five level uh, for today. Which so today at lot five is, is the level is sitting at around the 17.8 or just under 17.9 metres AHD. So can, that gives you a bit of a, an idea about how much of an increase to expect with those different flow rates. So all of that's available uh, online as part of the suite of mapping products. Um, that, that you can look at, uh, inundation mapping that's available online. There's a couple of caveats to uh, interpreting that mapping data that's available online. So we'd just like people to note that any products such as those um, estimated water, water levels or inundation maps, they are developed using hydraulic and hydrologic models. Okay, So they're not based on historic events necessarily. Um, they're, they're based on a model which has been developed. Um, so in reality, flood events differ due to a range of factors. So there might be differences in vegetation cover from what there was previously, um, physical changes in the river channel between the previous events and these events, or, or the presence and removal of, or damage even, of earthen structures, what levee banks and things like that. So, so those mapping tools are a guide. Um, they're a fairly good guide to whether a particular piece of land might be flood prone. Um, but they're, they're not based on historic events necessarily and they're not a guarantee. Um, so there are, I'm, I'm coming towards the end of uh, basically my update for the night, but there are currently 400 and, uh, sorry, 549 gates open at the barrages um, and, the, and the information to hand at, at this stage is that they are releasing as much water as possible and it's unlikely that anything downstream there would be an impediment um, if the understanding is that the barrages can release the water that comes down. So the last point I had was about hypoxic water. So it's, it's important to note that there are hypoxic um, water, black water events happening upstream currently, um, upstream of the South Australian border. So that's when the level of dissolved oxygen in the water um, falls and basically it causes the water to turn black and smelly and it's bad for fish, very bad for fish. Um, at this point, there are no current reported blackwater events in South Australia. However, it's likely given what's happening upstream, 
that blackwater events in South Australia, you know, probably will occur. Um, so there are a number of South Australian agencies that are closely monitoring that situation and they'll, they'll undertake mitigation measures where they're appropriate and, and within the constraints of what they can actually do. Um, so that's, that's basically the flow and level update that I've got to give tonight. So yeah, I'll leave it there um, and take any questions later. Thanks very much, Matt. Okay, the next person I'd like to uh, call up is Tony Sibia, the CEO from the Landmark Ferengi Council, who's going to give you a bit of an update of the, the works that they're doing for the community in the, in the background, although some of that has been very obvious and you will have noticed a lot of work going on. So I'll call up Tony to explain what he's been doing. Thanks, thanks very much, Penny. Um, just have to apologise for my uh, Barry White style voice at the moment. I've got a bit of a sore throat, but um, uh, yeah, as Penny mentioned, um, so we commenced working on our levy system on the 24th of October. So our complete levy system that's in our flood mitigation strategy is 38 kilometres. Um, so we've engineered that so that we can cater for flows of 250 gig, plus we've also allowed for a buffer of 200 mils for, for wave action and stuff like that. So you, you've heard, you've heard uh, from Matt uh, that uh, the predicted flows, so the first peak is between 170 and 180, and the second one's between 185 and 220. So we've been conservative with what we're doing with our levies and we've gone higher than that, so we've catered for in excess of that. Um, so we're scheduled, so you see there's been a lot of action since I stood up here last in, uh, in the last three weeks. So we, there's 22 segments that make up our levy system and we've got three left to complete. Um, so we're working on the Crescent West Bank at the moment. Uh, we're also working on um, D Bank, which goes behind the Jane Eliza, and also E Bank, which goes um, north of Gore Street. So we're, we're hoping to have them completed by mid next week. So um, we will finish them before the first peak flows come in, which we estimate. Uh, the 10th of the border, you add roughly four days, so we're expecting it to be about the 14th that um, peak, the first peak flow will hit Rema. Um, so all of our works have been um, engineered by our consultant engineers and they've actually been peer reviewed by SA Waters engineers. So if um, there's any concerns with what we've been doing with, with our levies, um, we've been getting very good compaction rates with, uh, with the work that we've been doing. We've been able to source excellent material um, out at uh, Wentworth Road. So in terms of the levies, uh, that's all been really good. Um, we, we are now commencing daily monitoring of our levy system. So we, we did a dry run on Monday and we, we actually did a full um, run of all of our levy system today. We actually didn't get through the whole thing today, but um, we're sort of fine tuning that. So our, our monitoring is a combination of using drone technology, but also using gators. So we have two teams that go around in gators. And essentially they have a GIS cloud uh, application. So if they see any uh, issues with any of the levies, they can log it into the cloud. Um, and then obviously we can, that is fed into the SES as well. Um, we, have a, we have a levy engineer on standby, so if there is any issue with any of our levies and we've logged it, we can then quickly ring a levy engineer um, and get advice on what we should do with the particular issue, uh, if there is any. So we didn't have any today, which is really excellent. Um, you may have also seen that we're stockpiling material around the levy system, so in the, in the event that we do have any issues, we already have material stockpiled. We have contractors um, on standby and an engineer on standby. Uh, just in terms of our levy system, can I just ask the community, can you please not drive on the levies? So I was told on the weekend that driving on the levies will, will help 
compact the levies, it won't. Um, so they've been compacted by a 10 ton roller that is specifically there to compact them. They've been compacted really, really well. Driving on a levy will not help. Uh, if anything, it's going to create uh, wheel ruts um, and getting on and off of levies uh, you know, could potentially damage them. So please, please don't drive on them. Um, we appreciate the community want, want to help with the monitoring of our levies. So we are at the moment creating a community levy bank uh, monitoring fact sheet. So we should finish that sometime next week. So always lots of people are driving around looking at the levies. We want to show you what the potential issues could be um, and who to ring in the event that that does occur. Um, so sometime next week we'll have that out, we'll have it on our socials, we'll share it widely so the community can, can assist. Uh, just moving on to stormwater, so um, you would have seen lots of stormwater pumps coming into town, so essentially as the water is rising, we're having to close off all of our, well not all, but we're having to close off the majority of our stormwater outlets. So in Remark we have about 32 stormwater outlets, 27 of them have to be closed. So every time we close one of them, we deploy um, a diesel um, powered pump um, to essentially make sure that if we do get a rain event, uh, that those pumps are there to pump the, the water out of the town. So they range from, you'll see two inch pumps right up to the, the big one down at the Tata River Front Precinct, uh, which is a 12 inch pump, which pumps a lot of water. So they're placed depending on how big the network it is that, uh, that we've placed up. Um, so those pumps, they're, they're going to remain in, in place for uh, quite a period of time. So uh, if the flow does drop down to uh, 100 gig, then essentially we can start to um, take some of those pumps away. Um, Brad mentioned about floodwaters. Um, I'm going to back him up and say, please do not um, play in floodwaters, particularly around 21st Street. It's very fast flowing through there. Um, it may be all right today, but if we get an extra five gig, which is roughly what it's going up per day, it's not going to be the same conditions tomorrow. So I think you know, members of the community, older members of the community might remember in 1974 that two people actually did drown at 21st Street. So we all love yabbies, we all love yabby. There's going to be plenty of time to yabby when the water recedes, um, but please do not play in, in floodwaters and particularly around 21st Street. Um, I'll just touch on quickly on Friday we launched our Go Local First campaign so I think in situations like this it's imperative that we do um, support our local businesses so uh, if you go to golocalfirst.com.au uh, get involved in the campaign um, so we're go reaching out to businesses We'll probably reach out to our local member who's over here as well and get him involved in, in the campaign as well as the Premier. Um, so if you look on our, uh, on our socials, on our Facebook and our Instagram, uh, you can see that we're promoting local businesses um, who, who really need you to spend local now. Um, I think that's probably about it. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Tony. All right, um, I'm going to call another Tony now to come up. Um, so Tony, Tony number two is from um, Department of Infrastructure and Transport. So you sometimes hear us talking about DIT and DIT to do roads, ferries, and freight. So Tony. Hi, I'm Tony number two. <laughs> So my name is Tony Scarlett and my role is the Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator within Regional South um, with Road Maintenance. I'm based out of Murray Bridge. So I'll be giving you a brief overview of the impacts of the, um, this event to ferries, marine safety and state roads today. I do have an information flyer available over on the table over there and it will list all the web pages and phone numbers and stuff that I mentioned in this presentation so you don't necessarily have to take notes. Um, so I encourage you to pick that up while you're here for yourself and neighbours and friends. Um, so our department's been involved in preparing and planning um, for this event since August and we've worked really hard to try to identify any marine and road issues 
that may occur during this flooding event. We've carefully considered what roads might be subject to flooding and prepared plans and detour routes uh, that may occur and we've published them on our website for the public to view so they can prepare ahead of time. As many of you will already know, Book Penum Road closed this morning once the water came up onto the roadway. We tried our hardest to keep it open as long as possible, but it was just no longer safe to do so. Um, but due to our careful planning, we were able to quickly close it once the decision was made. Morgan Road near Barmer is also closed to support the levy works um, that Berry Barmer Council are doing there to protect their critical infrastructure for their townships. We'll continue to monitor the other roads and we'll install traffic controls or close roads when needed and communicate these changes through our social media and website as quickly as possible. All current road closures, including council roads, are listed on the Traffic SA website. And as others have said here today, it's never safe to drive through flood waters at any time. And if members of the public come across any dangers on the road, including flood waters, they can be reported 24 seven to the traffic, the traffic Management Centre on 1800 018313. The ferries are also being closely monitored and we are already seeing some needing to be closed as the water comes up above the highest landing point. The Lyric Ferry closed yesterday and the Man Ferry is closing tonight. The Wakeley Ferry is moved to its high landing so should be able to stay open for much longer. We're expecting the Morgan Ferry to close next week with some of us following in the weeks after that. All ferry closures will again be communicated via social media and through our website, and you can check the ferry's operational status through our dedicated web page. Again, our marine team are working really hard to try to squeeze out as much time as possible to keep the ferries open. Some of you may have seen the recent vessel restrictions for the River Murray, which have been in place since the 23rd of November and they advise that a four knot speed limit, which is commonly referred to as a fast walking speed, for any vessels operating within 250 metres of any property partially or fully submerged, and within 250 metres of any levee partially or fully submerged. The four knot limit also applies to all vessels operating at night or in restricted visibility. In addition, all personal watercraft, commonly referred to as a jet ski, must not exceed four knots on any part of the river mode. There is also to be no swimming, bathing or diving within 250 metres of a lockable weir and no operating unpowered vessels within 250 metres of a lockable weir. This includes canoes, kayaks, surf skis, rowboats or other human powered vessels or aquatic toys. Vessel operators on vessels 12 metres and under are required to ensure all passengers on board were a level 50 or above life jacket while underway or attained. These restrictions apply from the South Australian border to the ferry landings at Wellington. The Marine Safety Team asks all users of the Murray River to take care of on or near the water and watch for hazards on the water. Our team have been marking out hazards with yellow buoys and signage and members of the public can report any hazards to our team via our website. Keep in mind that some hazards are under the water such as jetties and pontoons, which make them extra dangerous because they could be hidden. The best way to find the marine safety information is to Google marine safety, and it's the first link on the return search list. As of today, there is a new 50 metre exclusion zone around the electricity power lines standing in River Murray floodwaters to help keep communities safe and avoid unnecessary disconnections. In general, it's highly recommended that all vessels stay away from the floodplain areas where possible. Should entry to the area be required, vessel operators should observe the 50 metre exclusion zone around power lines and infrastructure. Failure to adhere to this direction could result in prosecution and significant fines. People should always assume that power lines are live and potentially lethal, and the risk is heightened in the presence of water. Avoiding the area is the safest course of action. I'm hanging around for questions and everything afterwards, so I'm happy to answer anything. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tony. Right, the next person um, I'd like to call up to speak to you is Barbara from Primary Industries and 
regions, as say sometimes you hear us referring to her or to um, the agency as Persa. So thanks, Barbara. That's way too tall for me. Sorry. Now I'm too close. Um, look, I... Too short. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Um, I don't have a lot of new stuff to tell you uh, from the last meeting, but I would like to reiterate a few things. PERSA continues to do our um, monitoring as well, and we do our overlay mapping uh, higher than the predicted DW forecast as well. So we have a, a reasonable idea of what land is going to be inundated and what, what is growing on there. We do expect that there will be some fruit trees, some um, grapevines, pasture, and once you move the low lot one, there'll be um, dairies and, and other swamp areas that will be inundated. Um, we are also ground truthing that if we, because we do understand that levee banks and a whole lot of other things that aren't part of the modelling. So we are constantly checking to make sure we've got that right. PERS is also part of every other response um, department and, and team and, and talk regularly. So. Anything that does come in through us as, as part of the Regions team, we also pass through to the right um, appropriate department. We uh, do have someone that is, that is sitting in the newly established Relief Centre in Ferry, and they're there primarily to help people to fill out the current expression of interest for the, the primary industries um, flood support packages, where which Right now, we don't have the guidelines for, we only have an expression of interest. So it's available on the website, or if you prefer to go in and, and do it with uh, someone in person, the Relief Centre has someone there. We also um, do have our farm and business mentors that are there for anybody who has a farming uh, a farm business, or even just a main street <coughs> business, or any business in fact, and they're there to, to talk to you at any time. Sitting in the room somewhere, is one of them up the back. We've got oh, we've got two. Gee, five one get one free. Um, uh, so John Chase and Brent Fletcher are sitting in the back, and we also have Robin Kane, who is also makes up the trio. They're amazing. They've got lots of skills and are, are really over where um, people can go to for additional uh, support or information. So I encourage you to use them, and uh, once again, their, their phone numbers are available on our website. Um, we do still have our fruit fly um, issue in the Riverland, how else to say it, and most people would know that uh, we've now had um, an, a, a small extension on that, and we're looking at the beginning of February before uh, we can look at fruit fly free status again. Uh, so we do still have all of our team on board doing what, what they would normally do. Um, except, I would like to say that um, we have had to uh, support, we are supporting the, the information sharing as much as possible. So you may have actually been knocked, uh, had a door knock from a person in Orange that's actually supporting the SES and, and other agencies in, in actually door knocking. So we are also working with other agencies. We had staff that were available, so they're also supporting. So um, if you do have someone in Orange Door knocking, uh, they may actually be helping the SES ask them for some verification. Uh, we've also got our, oh, the fr uh, fruit fly uh, group have also moved to the field day site so that they're on this side of the river to actually reduce travel time and be accessible for everybody. Um, we also have our normal uh, varroa mite, uh, foot and mouth, and uh, we encourage everybody to have the, the Japanese encephalitis vaccination, but we are still monitoring the other two. In the event of um, a, an emergency, PERSA has responsibility for animal welfare, so if there are any animals that are distressed or stranded, uh, please give our hotline a number and we will work with the relevant agencies and people to make sure those animals are looked at in the best way possible. And that has actually already happened a few times, so it's, it's not unusual um, because as everybody's mentioned uh, before, water can change very quickly, we can have inundation very quickly and isolation can happen very quickly. Um, we also um, have, uh, we've 
We have black water that is managed by the Department of Environment and Water, but if there is a fish kill, um, the cleanup is actually managed by primary industries. So we've already deployed a and have in place a group of people ready um, to uh, be put put on on ground if there is a, a substantial fish kill and we're utilising whatever resources we can that are local so that uh, the response can be uh, timely. So, so once again, that, that can be reported through the Fish Watch or the Fish App, both of which are on the PERSA website. Um, and just finally, I'd just like to also reiterate that the roads and transport is a concern for everybody. We have a, a substantial grain harvest that's under, uh, is, is um, being taken off right now. There are a lot more trucks on the road than what there normally would be and they're actually using a smaller number of uh, road routes. So please be mindful of um, our farmers that are actually also trying to uh, get their product off and where it needs to be. Thank you. Thanks very much, Barbara. Right, um, Tony seems to be a popular name tonight. I'd like to call up another Tony now um, from Housing SA who's going to talk about relief. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tony Davis. I'm from Housing SA uh, the, in the emergency relief unit. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about emergency relief centres. Uh, we are tasked by the State Emergency Centre to open up relief centres where the impact on the community during an emergency event prevents people from returning to their homes for a period of time. Relief centres provide short-term shelter, information, support and if activated, grants. Where are relief centres located? Well, the State, em State Emergency Centre will decide on the safest location for staff and also the community. We have over 300 pre-identified sites to select from in South Australia. Currently, as, currently, as we uh, have found out tonight, there is a relief centre open up in Berry. We encourage you to come down and ask questions, um, perhaps have a cup of tea, something to eat, and uh, talk to our participating agencies. Agencies there at the moment are Red Cross, Disaster Recovery Ministries, PERSA, um, many other um, in, uh, many other participating agencies that can answer your questions for you. Accommodation has been very hard to source in the region. We've worked very, very hard to try and locate adequate accommodation. At this particular point in time, we would strongly encourage you to source accommodation. For information regarding relief centres, including financial assistance, other supporting uh, agencies, we encourage you to go on to sa.gov.au. Thank you. Great, thanks Tony. Um, and just a reminder that all of the agencies who are speaking tonight are going to be around afterwards, so if you've got particular questions, um, we will be able to, um, to try and answer those a bit later. All right, next person is Paul from SA Power Networks, please. Thank you. Um, just from the outset, I want to say that we're monitoring flood levels actively and continuously and have been since the event started to unfold. Um, it's our absolute desire to leave the power on to as many people as possible. We understand how much electricity impacts people's lives, so that's our our focus to try and make sure we impact the least amount of people as we possibly can. But unfortunately, as all of you would know in this room, electricity and water don't mix, and there's going to be times where we have to take supply off, and that's for people's safety. The last thing we want to see is that there is a death or a catastrophic injury to somebody because we haven't done what we need to do. 
We began planning quite a, uh, quite a while ago and we've adjusted our plans as the flood forecasts have either come up or, or gone down. We've done that in conjunction with looking at what the SES do. We sort of follow that model of where they believe um, floods will, will come up to and go down and that's how we've sort of pushed our plans uh, through, uh, through the, the mix at, at our workplace. There's no doubt about it that lower lying regions at risk of, of flooding um, are the ones that are most at risk of disconnection. There's been a number of disconnections that have already taken place uh, and there will be some more to come as the, the river levels rise. What has been good news is what you heard a little bit earlier today through the um, Department of Infrastructure and Transport that there's this new announcement of an exclusion zone of 50 metres around electrical infrastructure. Following that is our expectation, the Office of the Technical Regulator, they're the ones that look at the, the minimum height distances that you must have between a, a ground level, or in this case a water level, and your infrastructure. Um, and they're looking at reassessing what is the true safe level that needs to be adhered to. That should give us greater scope, we hope, to significantly reduce the number of disconnections that need to take place particularly for people outside of flooded areas that are, that are served by those lines that go through flooded areas. Uh, and a note to all that when it comes to recovery from this event, we're expecting that restoration is going to be probably more challenging than what the disconnection actually is that takes place. When we come out to disconnect, it's under you know, blue skies, water might not quite be at your doorstep yet, we're in accessible roads, it's the vanilla outcome for us to be able to get out to a property. When floods recede, if roads have been washed away or areas are still quite boggy, it's going to be difficult to, to get to those areas to actually enable a reconnection to take place. So we just ask you for your patience. We will get in and reconnect as soon as it's absolutely possible. Where we are likely to disconnect, we're trying to provide, provide as much notice as possible. Um, I put a number of these flyers on the back table in that corner where the SES notice is um, and I, I ask you to pick one of those up. There's a number of QR codes on the front for those that are familiar with QR codes. One of them is about signing up to our SMS service. That's how we're going to communicate with everybody through this event. If your property is at a possibility of disconnected, we'll be sending you an SMS uh, through, that, through that service. If you're not sure how to use a QR code, like myself, um, I'm not a, a, a huge technology fan, um, there's numbers at the bottom of this flyer, 131261, and we just ask you to call that number, we'll take you through the process, we'll sign you up um, through that process, so you don't have to be a whiz at knowing how to, to operate these things. Um, when it comes to ongoing through the event, uh, we're, our aim is to SMS you weekly, just to identify with you that flood levels are still too high, we can't get in yet, we can't get in yet, and when the time comes for restoration and we're actually going to be near your property, we'll give you advance notice that we're, we're coming in. At the moment, we send out an advice to you that we're likely to disconnect if we know that your property is potentially going to be inundated. The issue that we've got is all of our maps are two-dimensional. They're all old maps, they're two-dimensional maps. Um, so our crews get out on site, and when they get out on site, they make an assessment to see if you're actually going to be impacted. If you're not going to be impacted, they won't look to disconnect you. So as of this week, there was a number of disconnections that didn't actually take place, because our crews got on site. You could actually see from the topography of the land, it's unlikely you're going to be impacted at the, the forecast levels, so we won't disconnect but there are times where we absolutely have to. We're going to advise the retailer that sends you the bill that we've disconnected your property. Uh, and we're doing that so that that disconnection happens and there's no nasty surprise of an estimated bill coming to you for the time that you haven't actually been there. Um, so you get something in the mail that you know, doesn't make, make sense. We'll also advise your retailer when we've reconnected supply as well. If you're a local business um, and you haven't already contacted us about the possibility that you might be in the, in the flood zone, uh, we ask you to contact us immediately. We can help uh, you assess whether we think you're going to be impacted. If you want to arrange for an electrical contract to lift part of your uh, electrical um, switchboard or your pumps or whatever you're using out of the water line, 
will expedite those alterations quickly. We've got a lot of people on the ground in this area ready to come out at a moment's notice and just expedite those, those jobs. I'm, I'm aware that there's probably many businesses that may not have come to these events or may not be looking at the live stream. So from a local perspective, we're asking you that if you know that there's people that aren't present here tonight that might be impacted, if you could encourage them to contact us if they are a business and they're looking to do something, um, and we'll do everything we can to assist them uh, where possible. Uh, very much want to see as minimal impact as we can. We want to see the economic prosperity of the community continue. We know there's a, a number of people potentially in this audience whose livelihood depends on some of those as well because you're working for some of those people. So we're going to do what we can to, to lessen that impact. Um, if you're unsure again how to register for the SMS, I'm happy for you to call us or leave your details on the, the notices over there. From a safety perspective, I might be telling you stuff you already know, but I always like to mention this uh, just in case we've got people in the room that you know wouldn't think of doing these things, but if your property's likely to be flooded, um, to make it electrically safe before the waters rise, we encourage people to switch off and unplug any electrical appliance you have and either take it to a safe place or raise it above those flood levels. We ask people to turn off their main electrical switch at the switchboard. Um, and if you've got a solar system um, with a battery, we ask you to turn that off as well. So you can isolate your solar panels, um, and if you're not sure how to do that, we just ask you to call us on the, the 131261 number and we'll take you through the steps that you've got to do that. You've paid a lot of money for these systems to put them up, you want them to be working when the time comes to come back to your property and have them turn on and work for you without too much, too much issue. If your property is uh, impacted uh, definitely um, and water comes up to your general power outlets, the low, living power, low level power outlets that you might have around your skirting boards, um, you need to get an electrician, we, we encourage you to get an electrician to come in and have a look and make sure everything's safe. If the water impacts your switchboard, uh, primarily outside for pretty much all of you, I would suggest, if it impacts your switchboard, the electrician will need to fill out what's called an electric, electrical certificate of compliance to give you some surety that your property is safe to move back into. When you do return and your property has been impacted by water, if you feel any shock or tingling sensation when you're using taps, in your bathroom or in your kitchen or your shower, we'd ask you to contact us immediately. That means something's happened at your property and we can potentially rectify it uh, or we will tell you you'd need to get an electrician to come out and have a look at that, that problem. But that's an important one. That's telling you there's something, there's something wrong. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the reduction of, of having um, floating um, things in the water like um, you know any craft that you can put into the water and the fact that you've got to reduce your speed we just ask you now that there's that 50 meter exclusion zone i'd even i'd even push that to say it's 150 meters is as far away as what you need to be from any electrical infrastructure you see in water which is pretty much the length of the football field from goal line to goal line we suggest you don't get any closer than that to, to that infrastructure particularly when you see that the water has risen. Our infrastructure in the streets is at a height for a reason. It's not there just to keep it out of the way and for us to be able to you know, work on it with the cherry pickers that we have. Um, it's at that height to reduce electric shock, the potential electric shock. If you have a metre or a metre and a half of, of water that starts to reduce the level between those two areas, um, you could see that a person, that, you know, I'm, I'm six foot one, if I put my hands in the air, that's two and a half metres. So I've just reduced significantly that, that distance. The last thing you want to, again, have is somebody that gets severely impacted by coming into contact with, with power poles. There's been a bit of discussion, I'm not sure if it's been in the, in the local press here, about the Renmark sub substation. Uh, the Renmark substation is our most, probably our most vulnerable substation in the, in the Riverland area. Um, it's already defended by a levy, uh, but we've installed a, a clay rubble bund around that, that substation to take it up to 250, a 250 gigalitre uh, type level. Uh, not that that's being expected in this event, but that's been done as a, as a protection. On top of that, um, Department of Infrastructure and Transport have also built another levy around our levy 
a double levy, if you, if you will. Um, and that second levy is a concrete levy um, that's been built to a greater standard than 250 gigalitres. So I think they're, they're pretty much, and it's not to spook people, they just want to future proof the fact that you know, if any further floods come in the future, um, we've built something that's a, you know, almost a small castle around this substation because it supplies power to about 5,000 people and businesses in this local area. So something that, that needs to be protected. Um, from a personal perspective, what can you do? We encourage you to sign up for this SMS service. We encourage you to speak to your neighbours, the businesses that I've talked about, encourage them to sign up for this SMS service. That's how we're going to contact you. If you already get information from us whenever you have a planned or an unplanned outage, if you're already getting SMSs about that, that means you're signed up already um, and you can feel quite comfortable. If you're unsure, just call us. Um, that's probably all I've really got for you except just to really encourage others to, to sign up where you can. It's not, a, it's not a foolproof service, our SMS service that advises of disconnections coming through. It's a likely, there's a li likelihood that you're going to be disconnected. It will only be when our crews get on the ground and are able to put that third dimension into the maps that we've got that we'll be able to see if we actually need to disconnect you or not. If you've got concerns, my compatriot Sam Oosterholt, perhaps Sam if you just stand up, He's got uh, some electronic maps uh, here that can give you a view of whether if you're in one of those low lying areas you think you might be impacted. We'd be happy to share some of that information with you, uh, most certainly. We haven't published a lot of that information for a reason. Um, we understand in the eastern states there's been some unscrupulous behaviour with people looting homes, uh, taking advantage of people that are impacted by flood waters. We didn't want to give that same sort of blueprint for people that want to engage in that activity here for people that live in this area to say that people are going to be out of their homes. As is the case with planned and unplanned interruption information we send through this SMS service, usually you're going to stay at your home. If it's a, if it's a storm, you're going to be at your own home. You're not going to leave that home for a long period of time. In this case, people that are impacted by flood may be leaving for weeks or months. So we don't want to create a blueprint for people to come in and do what they, they potentially would look to do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. All right, uh, the last speaker that we have for this evening is uh, Nigel from SA Water. Thank you. My name is Nigel Rothko. I'm a manager of engineering with SA Water's River Murray Operations out of Barriers. So, um, um, SA Water has three main functions up and down the river uh, in the riverbank communities uh, wastewater services, water treatment or water supply services, and operation of the locks and weirs. And so I'll just step through all of those relatively quickly. I have to make it hold it. Um, I won't go into wastewater services. There is actually no SA water wastewater services up in this part of the Riverlands, so we won't need to touch on that today. Uh, I will go through drinking water services in a bit more detail. Uh, firstly, there are no impacts to drinking water services at this time, um, but as that heat continues to come up, there may be uh, things that occur, um, and so I'll just talk through some of those things that we might see. Uh, with regards to the quality of your water, uh, you've heard Matt talk about the Blackwater events that are happening um, interstate and that may end up happening down here uh, when you get those high of organic material in the water and you lose the oxygen. Uh, there are no in, none in South Australia as we speak. Um, our treatment plants are all designed to, to deal with Blackwater events. Um, they, they're able to manage a very large range of water source uh, quality. Um, if if the black water does get to a point where it's beyond the capacity for the treatment plants to manage, you may just notice temperature changes to the taste and smell of your drinking water, if it's still safe, but um, it just might have no doubt. Uh, when it comes to drinking water supply, the main concern that people I imagine have is around uh, whether or not the water treatment plants will be inundated, um, and um, we anticipate that there will be no impact to the water treatment plants themselves. They were built um, above the level of the um, expected water. Um, there are a number of pump stations that deliver water into those treatment plants that aren't probably built as high, and we do take water from other third party like central irrigation. Um, we're working with each of those groups 
to understand potential impacts to the treatment plants from that from those sources. Um, and we will deal with them on a case by case basis as we work out what those impacts might be. Um, where there is uh, anticipated to be a, a, an impact, we will be working uh, alternative arrangements, uh, that being generators, um, tanking, tanking water. Uh, there are a number of other things that are being looked at um, down that road at the moment. Um, the other part of water supply is making sure that we have adequate treatment supplies so all the chemicals that are used to treat that water and we are, are working through um, those at the moment, making sure that we have backup pumps, generators, stockpiles of chemicals, all those sorts of things to make sure that we can continue to treat water. Um, and uh, if there is going to be an interruption, um, we'll be able to communicate with um, customers. Um, there are a range of ways you can do that. Um, the best way is actually to get onto our website and there's a link through to a um, registration part where you will receive notifications if there is any anticipated interruption to water supply. Um, the final area that we operate in is the locks and weirs, um, and it's no surprise that those are all along the water now. Um, so navigation along the river is, is no longer through the locks, they were closed and you can travel straight through the navigable pass. Um, please follow all the boating rules that have been outlined by the Department of Transport around the locks and weirs um, with regards to safety and make sure that using a channel markers. They, the locks and weirs are a massive um, underwater obstruction if you don't know what you're doing around there. So please uh, make sure that you're, you're following all the rules when you go through those. Um, we operate locks and weirs from Loch Nile all the way down to the barrages, and as um, was mentioned, the barrages are being used to get rid of all of this water as quickly as we possibly can and there are most of the gates are open to deliver that water out of the mouth and all dredging operations that SA water does down the mouth to keep the mouth open in other times are going to cease. Um, as all of the other agencies have mentioned please visit sa.gov.au to get information on the flood um, or if you want specific SA water stuff you can follow us on Facebook Facebook or go to or call one to three hundred to save water. Thank you. Sorry, there's no quiet way of doing that, is there? Um, all right. So that brings us to the end of all of the speakers' presentations. Um, I just wanted to just say a couple of things. As you can um, probably, or as you've probably um, gathered from this evening so far, there's a lot of agencies working really hard in the background to try and keep the community as safe as possible. Um, we're really pleased to see so many people here today because one of the best things that you can do as members of the community is to to take some responsibility and take some actions yourselves. And doing things like coming out to these meetings and getting information is really powerful for you. Um, we had somebody at one of our global meetings um, recently stand up and said that she had been impacted by flooding three times in New South Wales in the last year. And she found the information that we provided was really, really valuable and she wished that she had had that information going into her experiences. So um, we know that we're providing um, you know, good quality information for you, but by you guys being here and actually getting the information and taking it away and, and acting on it, um, then you can play your part in keeping, us, um, you know, keeping everybody safe. So um, we're just re reminded that we've got all the fact sheets and whatnot if you know people who weren't able to get to these meetings tonight or don't get on the internet or whatnot, please feel free to take those things with you. Um, just before I open up to questions, I just want to say one more thing. We have also just started sending out what we call emergency alert messaging. So that's um, uh, a system that the emergency services can access where we can actually have access to people's phone numbers in. Um, in areas where we think they might be impacted by an emergency. So just uh, yesterday uh, we started actually sending out targeted text messages to people who live in areas that we think might be impacted. 
and we're also getting um, emergency services um, crews out there to door knock on um, door knock on people's doors and check their attention as whether they're going to stay or go, and just making sure that people are actually aware of the uh, the risks that are out there, and especially in terms of if power is turned off, have they thought about um, those those uh, you know impacts that that might have. And I just really encourage you all, you know, something that will hopefully many of you will be sitting here thinking, look, this isn't actually going to impact me, I'm, I'm fine behind the levy. Um, but think about what might be impacted in your daily routine. So it might be your, your inability to get to work in your normal um, routine. You might have to do a very long detour around or, um, you know, what would happen if the power went off in our area. Um, and again, try and think about workarounds for those things now. Um, there's no risk if you leave too early. There's absolutely no risk at all to anybody. Um, the minute we start getting people trying to leave late, if you do think you might be impacted, then that puts many people at risk. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, um, also just uh, helping each other out. So just being aware of your locals in your community. You might be aware of some vulnerable people um, or perhaps people who don't speak English as a first language. So helping out those um, and, and giving each other support where you can. Um, we also acknowledge that this can be quite difficult in terms of raising people's um, anxious, anxiousness levels. Um, this is a, a long haul event, unfortunately. So if you do feel like you're getting um, you know, this is starting to kind of eat away at you and keep you awake at night. Um, the Red Cross are available here tonight. Um, I've got Jenny sitting in a bright red shirt over there who will be hanging around later. But we also encourage you to talk to your local GP or friends or family if you're starting to feel like this is impacting um, on your mental health as well. It's important to look after that as well. All right, I'm going to um, call Corey Fraser up. Corey is one of our planning officers and he's going to be my um, running with the second microphone around person. Um, so I'd like to up the floor now to questions. I've got oh, one lady's hand to up very quickly down the front here. Hello, my name is Tony Henry. I have uh, two hatch books on the Murray Avenue um, uh, in the business district. Thank you everybody for all the information that you're all giving and the, um, it's been very informative for all of us, I, I would assume. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I have two questions. Now, the last meeting, I didn't get a chance to ask my questions. I did put them on the, uh, and I still haven't heard anything, but I have noticed a few things with the government. That would be council um, website. So that kind of answered one question, but I still have questions for Tony. <laughs> He's fine because he knows I'm going to ask them. Um, the first is, with all the data that was taken on the levees, the riverfront, and I've had lots of people go, um, it's built up to the 56 level, but if you have a look where the VIC is sitting, the Visitor Information Centre, it's sitting on top of the levee and then it comes down. Please, in that information that was gathered, what would the level be before that bank would get broken, like before it would come over? Yes, so, um, really good question. Um, so, this afternoon, we, so we have been um, lobbying SES for defence cells, so the product that um, is used by the Army, essentially, um, and we were allocated defence cell this afternoon. So, um, the, the levels there, vary a little bit, but the defence cell bags are 1.5 metres wide by 600 high, and if we run it from the VIC all the way through to Westpac Bank, that would give us enough coverage for, for what we suggested, the 250 plus the 200 mil um, freeboard. Um, so we're in constant communication with the clock, um, because we're essentially going to have to go straight over their deck we are going to install the defence cell. Um, so that will arrive in Remark next week. Um, so it will be stored in a sea container um, in the Westpac Bank um, cover and we'll have it there ready to go. We install the defence cell on the whole front of Murray Avenue. It will take about three days. Um, but So we have plenty of time, we have good warning and obviously talking to Matt and his team in terms of modelling um, and we have our session chats about how's the modelling looking and is it starting to close up 
Um, so, so we have that in place, ready to go if it is necessary. Sorry, the second question. Um, I, our buildings all the way along there, I've been told they all have cellars and with the rising waters, the waters rise in the cellars as well. I have two shops full of paper and I'm quite worried about that fact as to whether that is a definite thing that happens. I did go and talk to the RIT ladies a couple of weeks ago and they said in the 74 floods it actually got up to the top of their shins. There is a photo somewhere apparently of that. So I'm just wondering, um, is that a definite possibility with the rise of the water? I don't know who could answer that question, but as you can understand, my bookstore is my livelihood, so, and also for all the other businesses that may have, yeah. Thank you for the question. I think, <coughs> Specifically to your question, I'm not going to be able to tell you the exact answer for your same stuff, but I have to take my time uh, talking more detail. But yes, there's definitely risk of um, different situations there, different risk of flood waters, uh, whether it's conduits in different areas or different um, infections that may be in the ground that you may see, um, seepage and things like that, where it's water will come in places that you may not necessarily think they are. So they're things certainly to be aware of, uh, but yeah, more than happy to catch up afterwards and, and talk about that. I don't know who to um, address this one to. It's, it's about effluent. Um, um, I've just got someone who can answer the question about the basement, so I'll just pass it over to this person. Uh, hi, I'm Rosalie from Remark Irrigation Trust. Yes, the basement certainly filled up in um, 1974. Um, we have emptied ours out. Uh, we're not sure, we believe it's groundwater rather than uh, seeping into the very old building that we have. So I suspect those old buildings uh, will seep groundwater in and I'm, I'm very pleased to hear about the fund that you're getting in for that area because uh, hopefully that will protect us from the surface water. The Sorry, so Someone just made a comment that the Red Mark Hotel is already pumping this. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right, next question. Yes. Okay, um, I just had a query about effluent. Sorry. Um, about effluent, you know, like if you choose to stay in your own home, you've got a, a power source and water, you're above the level. Is that going, like, is it going to be any issue with your effluent? Do you have to block your toilets or anything? Um, in regards to the effluent system, if they're completely outside of the uh, impacted area and they're going to be completely maintained by your power source, then that, that system will work. Now, that'll, that'll be completely dependent on your you know, intricacies of your system and, and the, how that actually works. Uh, but if you, if you provide power for it, I don't suggest you should be right. Where we, where we have issues is where the systems are inundated uh, or power loss, so we have to continue to maintain the systems. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two questions. Um, one was um, in regards to those areas in our town that actually have um, underground electrical supply. How is that going to be impacted? And the other one is um, gas supplies. Um, how is that going to be uh, kept up? Because like the chain wise area, for example, um, we don't know how full it is and whether that's going to last the distance, because that would be that's right. How do you talk for the... I'll talk about the power question if you like. Um, it, it shouldn't... Underground power in Redmark itself, uh, the township, shouldn't be impacted at all uh, because you're not going to see any water in the township, so to speak. It's only if you saw water in the township that you'd have an issue, but that's not what is going to happen here, I believe. Yeah, so in terms of... Um, in terms of gas at Donalizer, so it's about 40% in that, that current bullet. Um, and we're just working on, because obviously we can't access that bullet anymore, we're working on how, how we place another one in a higher position where we can essentially cut into that line. So we're working with Origin at the moment on that. Thank you. 
Um, I've just got one question with respect to stormwater management. Uh, pleased to hear that you've got good plans for within the town area. But given that we've got these uh, flood banks now fully blocked off and the, the drainage pipes through them all blocked off as they need to be, uh, has there been any contingency planning for if we get another extreme rain event for the settlement area? For the town, obviously, that's what all the pumps are for, obviously. For the settlement area, no. No, it's not, and it's maybe it's something that we need to work on with you, uh, given that, you know, the rain event that we had of 100 mil. Um, yeah, certainly, happy to have a chat about it. Thank you. This is the value of asking questions, because sometimes some of the things um, are not on our radar, so it's good to be able to get those things on the radar so we can look at solutions to Maurice. Just can we have another question? Yep. Good, thank you, Norm Good. Um, why am I here tonight? We're only about two weeks away from our first major high coming through. When are we going to stop calling it a rising river and call it a very potentially dangerous floodwaters? So I can answer, I can that um, answer that partially. So um, there is a definition of flood versus a definition of high, uh, high flow. And so uh, once the river has got to 130 and up to 200 gigalitres a day, it's referred to as a flood. So we've actually started changing our wording um, on all our documentation from high flow to flood. So hence you've, you've seen uh, the Watch and Act message is now referring to uh, a flood event and all of our uh, resources and brochures are referring to it as a flood event. Thank you. The next comment is in relation to the interactive map which the Remark Council have got on their website, which I found out on Monday actually comes through from the Department of Environment. I understand it is a guide, but it is incredibly inaccurate. And it was pointed out to me today by some people at a meeting that their house never got wet in 1956, but they're actually sitting on the roofs now because it's totally underwater. But the thing I found with the map, which I believe is quite dangerous for anyone else outside, I didn't realise the Murray River had been totally relocated. Now what I'm saying by that, my business out at Baringa, on top of the hill, has the Mundy Creek that flows behind it. You've got all the other creek systems out around towards Armco Similoo. They're all on that map as the River Murray. Why can't they be called the correct name? I did speak to the Department of Environment on Tuesday, and no disrespect, but the guy I spoke to, well, it was over his head. Yeah, so the, the interactive map is, uh, is not actually fed from G. It's, it's done by a mapping company that we source to do it. We update that map three times a week. Um, what we've, we've had a little bit of feedback about it. Um, what, what we suggest is if people do pick up things that are not exactly correct, to let us know and we'll update it. So we had a situation where the mapping around the caravan parts wasn't quite correct. We got it fixed um, and because it wasn't taking into account the levees that they'd already built. So yeah, if there's any, if you pick up anything with the interactive map, let us know and we'll update it. Yeah, I did actually notify the council on Monday and they put me through Tony to Department of Environment. Um, and I was quite disappointed with the guy that spoke to me on Tuesday. He didn't quite really know what to do, but I think it's totally in inaccurate to have the River Murray showing where the Mundit Creek is and all the other creeks. And out take that on board and anything else normally you've got, yeah. um, let's know and yeah, we can put an update on that. Okay. Just another comment, and I thank all the presenters tonight, uh, as I did last time. I thought tonight would have been a fantastic opportunity to have some people that physically live, work, in 1956 on the levee banks, people like Henry Durden, Dans, Max Burr, etc., etc., to come to this meeting and physically tell us as the residents, if we have a major breach or a minor breach, whatever, 
what we can do to our own properties or what we can do to assist the council and the various other departments with that breach. A lot of us have got a lot of equipment that might help. But also in 1956, there were teams of men that went out to Cowpen and so forth, cutting mallee branches to, oh, excuse me, lie on all of the um, levee banks to stop the washing. I've already seen one levee bank on Rarrow Avenue that's getting undercut now. Is something like that going to happen? Because if we get one hell of a strong wind, uh, we're going to have problems. Thank you. Thank you for that. And certainly the levees are being monitored regularly and um, we, we would be really happy to have any feedback from you if you do notice any breaches of the, the levees because that's, again, lots of eyes and ears on the ground. We'll help um, the, the various agencies to monitor and maintain those. We've got another question over here and then we'll come down to the front for a question and we'll probably have to wrap it up then but all of the speakers will be here to um, to have further conversations with people one on one if they if they need. So over to the gentleman at the back, please. Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name's Craig Leader, so I've got two questions. One to Matt from June. Um, the question is is that where would be the best uh, place to get our information of the water heights and levels? Uh, yep. So there's there's a flood inundation mapping tool that's available if you go to that sa.gov.au website you can follow the links to uh, our and we've got a website our department's website which is called waterconnect.sa.gov.au yep so if you look there you can get it there or the other place is that um, weekly flow report that i've talked about so if in that flow report there's also a table um, that that links particular flow rates to to levels at that locations along so okay. that would be my suggestion. Okay, so you're saying you is the best place to get it? That's, yes. Okay, then your information is three days late. Okay. Isn't it? You, when you re reply, when you re your information goes, that is always three days late. The best place to get information from is the MDBA. Okay. They, they are a, a real time, every day. Mm -hmm. Tony was saying here before that he can get good information from you guys, yep. you tell us that the water takes four days to get from the border, I think. There's three days already gone. Right. Now, the thing is, at the minute, as you said before, there's 151,000 mm -hmm. coming through the border. There's 205 at Wentworth. There's 200 at Waikon Junction. There's 205 at Burke. Something's not really adding up here. Okay. I think there's more water coming than you guys are really telling us. Happy to take the conversation offline and check yep. into it for you. Yep. Um, it's not, I'm, I'm not responsible, for the responsible person for putting that data together, but I'm more than happy to check into it for you and get yep. back to you. That's, yep. that's, I'm quite yep. happy to have a chat with you afterwards if you like. No, that, I'll do that. Yep. But yep. you can see where I'm coming from. If these guys haven't got a long time to build something yep. and your information is three days late, we'll take it. Yeah. All right. I'm, like I said, more than happy to go through go through your concerns with you after, afterwards if you like. Yep. Um, I haven't got the, the information to, to banter with you about it now. Um, but, but yeah, more than happy to chase it up and, and follow it up and get an answer for you. If you like. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, my next two questions are to Tony, and he'll probably hate this. No, Tony's silly. He knows. <laughs> no, you don't want to stand up, Tony. Now, what I need to know, have you guys got a plan in place if the bank bust and how are you going to fix it? Yeah, so that's what I outlined with our monitoring regime. So if there is um, leakage, overtopping, uh, boils in any of our levees, we have already in place like a, a levee bank engineer that we can have come in give us the solutions as to how to do that. We have a stockpile material throughout the whole network um, and we also have contractors on hand ready to go. But isn't this guy in Adelaide? No, he's in Berry. He, he's in Rimmer. He's in Berry. Okay, yeah. all right. And then, we're trying to source another one for the Rimmer. Okay. We, we want coverage across the three councils. Yep. But we do have one 
Yeah, All right. Um, I asked uh, a question to the Mayor, and I believe one of your councillors was uh, proposed your question the other day that Norm Cook brought up a bloke's name in Henry Dugan dance as asked for help. But he can't get help because he's not in the council jurisdiction. If he pays rates and taxes, he's in the council jurisdiction. Down at Baxendale's bank was the first bank that broke around Renwick. They fixed that by putting tin in front of the hole and putting dirt behind it to stop it real quick. Because if you're just going to drop dirt in there, it's not, the water's going to be too strong and it's just going to wash straight away. But I believe Henry has done a lot for this town and I believe he needs help. He shouldn't be down there on his pissy little tra tractor trying to build up lakes that you blokes aren't interested in helping him. So, I mean, his property is outside of the power. That doesn't matter. Network, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take it on. That flood bank goes from where John Engove used to live, all the way along there, and back around Henry's place. Please don't tell me he's outside of your jurisdiction. If he pays you rates and taxes, he's in your jurisdiction. No, I wouldn't say that, mate. I'll say uh, well, if that's the case then, the council's a liar. Thank you. Um, I'll just say in relation to looking for people who need help, if you do know particular people who need help, um, if you can please let the relief staff know because they are putting together a list of um, particular individuals who might need further assistance. Um, I, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about talking about particular people who aren't here and, and divulging information. <laughs> so um, if we can perhaps just have those conversations with Relief SA, then we can capture those, those people. Um, if you do know of someone who needs help because a, uh, they need help with sandbagging or anything like that, um, they can ring the SES number on 132 500 and press 1 and that will actually log a job with us and we will come out and provide assistance, so um, please keep that in mind as well. All right, last question for the evening so that we can let people go on time. Um, lady in the thank you, thank you, Anne Rowe. I'm Chairman of the National Trust here in Remark. I have emailed the SES, tried to get help, and advised and you par partially answered that by that phone number. But what I wanted was somebody to just come and have a look. I've got six buildings, one's a lot cabin from 18, 89, I don't know. How many sandbags on there? Do I put a flood bank up? I'm hoping the flood banks hold, so we don't have to worry, but we're sending messages out to local people already, saying be prepared to leave. That doesn't give me a lot of confidence in the flood banks. Okay, so, um, yeah, look, I'll just reiterate, we're in that 132500 number. You need to press 1 if you want to go through to uh, have a job locked for you. So please, 132500 and press 1. Again, it's on the front of all of our brochures, so um, don't stress about trying to remember that number, but I'd love you all to put it in your phones um, before you leave tonight. All right, um, look, in the interest of, um, of wrapping up the meeting on time, I like being on time, um, we'll wrap it up now, but all of our guest speakers are staying around to um, answer any individual questions. I'll just remind you again, if you do have things that you don't want to um, hang around and ask, but you do want answers for, grab a bit of a sticky post at night from the table over there. Again, we've got the, um, the Greek from Javi and also Filipino information over there as well. So thank you everyone for coming and looking after your own safety um, and showing an interest in that and helping us keep you safe. Thank you.